Um, so I hope everybody can find a seat. Um, all right. Um, great. So yes. Um, good evening. Welcome to the New York Studio Schools virtual evening lecture series. Um, tonight, it is uh, my great great pleasure to be introducing some restrictions apply. I'll Daniali in conversation with Michael Brenson. Um, I want to thank them both for for taking time out of their schedules to be here for IL for presenting his work, and uh, I would like to thank all of you in the audience. Um, for taking the time. If you're in New York area, it's a quite a beautiful evening. Um, I would also like to just quickly thank um, on behalf of the New York Studio School, the generous support that um, we received from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, the Robert Lehman Foundation, um, and an award from the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, this programming and a lot of our programming would not be possible without your generosity. Um, so thank you. And if it's at all possible, think of making a donation to the studio school through our website, www.nyss.org. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I will introduce our speakers a bit more in just one moment, but I always wanna call attention to the Q&A button at the, at the bottom of your screen. Um, Michael and I will leave time for questions at the end of the talk, um, but feel free to enter in a question at any time during the conversation uh, or the presentation. And um, I'll do my best to come back to that at the end. Um, and you can put things in the chat too, but it's a little easier for me in the questions. Um, and with that, tonight's speakers, beginning with Michael Brinson, is an art critic and an art historian. He received a PhD in art history from Johns Hopkins University and was an art critic for the New York Times from 1982 to 1991. His publications include Visionaries and Outcasts, the NEA, Congress, and the Place of the Visual Art Artist in America, and Acts of Engagement, Writings on Art, Criticism, and in Institutions from 1993 to 2002. Michael is a Getty Scholar, Guggenheim Fellow, Bogliesco Fellow and Clark Fellow, and the Artistic Director of the Jonathan and Barbara Silver Foundation. His biography of David Smith, David Smith, The Art and Life of a Transformational Sculpture, Sculptor, will be published in the fall by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Um, and Ayal Daniele um, studied at the Bezalel Academy of Art in Jerusalem and the New York Studio School. He is the recipient of a Pollock Krasner Award in Painting, a NIFO Award in Drawing, and a Residency Award from the Lower East Side Print Shop. He has, a one, he has had one-person exhibitions at MoMA PS1, at the Martin Kudlick Gallery in Cologne, in Germany, and various group exhibitions in Europe and Israel. Ayal is represented by Elizabeth Harris Gallery here in New York City. Uh, so without further ado, Please join me in welcoming Michael Brunson and Ayal Daniele. Okay, so, uh, you know, thank you, Sam. And, you know, hi, everybody. Happy spring. Uh, you know, we're really glad to be part. We're glad to be here, glad to be part of this series that, that we've followed for a long time, and it's great. So I just thought that I would spend a minute or two giving you some idea of how this conversation came about. Um, Al and I met, I guess, in the late 80s, sort of early 90s, when he was a student at the studio school and then working at the school. And we would just meet each other at, at events and we had mutual friends. And, and I was very much aware of him <clears throat> as a presence at the school, but we never really had a conversation, I think, until uh, the Jonathan Silver show that was organized by Marion Smith at the studio school at the end of 2018. And uh, I organized the panel, um, Al came to the panel, he had an intervention at the panel that 
in which he spoke with um, you know, particular quality of engagement, a particular quality of mind that really stayed with me. And then we did a, we did a, a discussion in the gallery around the work and Al was present along with Amanda Guest, his partner and an artist who's uh, just as distinctive a voice as he is. And again, I just remember the, the, the particular quality of intelligence and the level of engagement that he brought to, to what he was talking about. And his remarks were um, quite remarkable to me. So when he had a show at the end of 2020 at the Elizabeth Harris Gallery, I went to the show and uh, saw the work and it began a, a conversation about the paintings and the drawings and what he was doing and, and the particular relationship to history and the particular way in which his work is, is haunted by history and the particular way in which he as an artist sort of deals with those hauntings. And then the conversation con continued when I interviewed him for the Silver Foundation because he had known Jonathan and we talked about art and, and uh, we talked about Israel and the United States, United States and, and the conversation just seemed like it had a kind of momentum that wanted to keep going and I was really interested in, in continuing it in whatever chance we had. So, when Al asked me if I would do this conversation with him as part of the Studio School series, I said, of course. So I'm really looking forward to seeing him talk about his work. Uh, and then afterward, we will continue the conversation and, and you will become part of it, I hope. Okay. I'll take it from there, I guess, Michael. I don't know that anybody hears me. Michael, do you hear me? Is... Yes, take it from there. It's yours. All right. All right. Well, good ev evening, everybody. I'm experiencing some technical difficulties here, but I, I think we'll overcome them. I'd like to thank everybody who's joined this evening. I'd like to thank the Studio School for inviting me to do this. Um, I'd like to thank Michael for uh, being my partner in crime this evening. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of a survey of what I've been up to for the past 20 years, uh, more or less, leading up to what's behind me on the wall. It's not necessarily a chronological survey. It's more like a tangential guided tour um, of, of what, I've, what have been my preoccupations, uh, my obsessions, and basically my work. Um, so this is a painting from 2001. Um, from leaving school up until more or less this period, I consciously avoided anything that had to do with identity issues in my work. I avoided anything that referenced my Israeli background. Um, and at a certain point in 1999, I felt like uh, I just couldn't, it was untenable anymore as an artist and as a person to avoid these things. There was what was called the second intifada in Israel. And I started to uh, look at the subject and at myself, so to speak. Um, this painting was painted literally on the night before 9-11. When 9-11, the events of 9-11 happened, certain overlaps, contextual overlaps between growing up in Israel and living in the United States uh, made themselves evident with the militarism, with the issues of national loyalty, um, the notions of shared enemies, all sorts of concepts and myths that I 
felt that I had to address. Um, and what happened was that I discovered that uh, my previous inclinations to work in series um, just came to the fore. I, I felt that these issues needed to be addressed in, in, in assemblages of imagery. And uh, I found myself uh, particularly inclined towards the silhouette. Um, at the time, the, the internet was at its infancy, if one could say that, and in relation to home users and, and private usage, the whole sense of uh, ubiquitous imagery and the onslaught of imagery, I, I felt that painting was somewhat in a, in a competition with all of that. Um, and from this moment on, uh, the pictorial series became a continuous preoccupation and a, a main creative structure and an expressive form for me. For, and for more than two decades, I've been, I've been um, using the series as, as, a, as a structure of both process and, and presentation. That being said, uh, the, the uh, single image uh, remained uh, a very important aspect of things. That is to say, when I do these series, I also look at each and every image and inquire into its own autonomy in its own, so to speak, integrity. Um, within and without the contextuality of putting it in a group. Um, and then there are questions of how sufficient it is to have a, an image on its own in relation to the group. Um, this is a, a, an exhibition that I had the privilege of showing in Germany. Some of the subject matter that I was starting to address was involving the history of myself as an Israeli, myself as a Jew, the relationship with the Holocaust, the, um, and the imagery that was brought into these things um, involved a myriad of, of sources from pictures of uh, synagogues that burnt in Europe, uh, Arab women in burqas, um, the helicopter as a surrogate for myself and the camel as a surrogate for myself. Um, but as I said, I continued uh, looking into the singular image, how it would hold up on its own. How can I uh, find a succinct mark, a succinct, um, description of, of something. And of course, the silhouette brought about a very particular kind of way of summing things up. Um, at this point and a bit earlier, also the, the uh, title of works, of series, of paintings, became very, very uh, integral to my notion of what it is I was actually seeking in these pieces. Um, uh, the, the various uh, uh, assemblages of these series uh, became site specific, so to speak. I would assemble them for particular exhibition spaces, uh, taking them out of my studio and uh, assembling them like this. Um, this piece was called Some of My Best Friends, as you could see on the screen. Uh, the helicopter, the camel, animals, uh, all of these things were making their way into the work. And I found myself uh, continuously uh, 
addressing the formal issues of scale and size and format, uh, taking the same imagery and uh, addressing it or testing myself uh, through questions of painterliness, rendering, um, I'm going to let just some of the images speak for themselves for a moment. Um, you could see water towers, which were a very particular emblem of a particular time in Palestine. Um, you know, it, it, I think it's important also to mention that some of this work, the past 20 years have been uh, mired in various economic, political, uh, war-torn issues all around the world. And I, I find myself sitting in New York, working in New York, while these things literally haunt me. Um, this is called Locate the Arab, Identify the Jew. Uh, camouflage became a metaphor, more or less, for my own sense of myself wanting to disappear into and away from these things at the same time. Um, I'm just going to keep on moving through some of these things. Um, some of the imagery that I found myself attracted to, and that's a funny word to use, were the burqa. At a certain point, I was invited to exhibit in Paris, and at the time that I was exhibiting there, the burqa became an object, uh, a symbolic object of, besides a religious freedom of, uh, uh, basically of uh, Muslim women and, Paris uh, claiming their right to bear something that to my mind seemed to be an object of objectification and control, yet for the people who were kind of these sorts of, uh, of negations within interpretation, um, I found myself attracted to that more and more. The title is You Have Been Pre-Selected. Anybody who's ever gotten a, uh, an offer for a credit card has read this and um, also the whole idea of selection within the history of the use of the word uh, in the Holocaust. Uh, it just resonated with me and I was just attracted to it in some strange way. Um, and at a certain point, actually preceding the pieces that we've seen till now and moving on from all along these 20 or 30 years, I embarked on a, on a series that were all drawn from life where I would have my model or models take the stance of the Zig Heil salute. Um, I was uh, in my disposition, disposition to invert things. I decided to make six million of, of these drawings. I have till now made hundreds of them, probably coming close to the thousand. It's not an actual uh, realistic endeavor. There's actually no way for me to do it in my lifetime. This uh, series at that point was called Good Morning, Mr. Kiefer, which was a direct reference to Anselm Kiefer, the German artist who started his artistic career actually photographing himself, taking the Nazi salute and actually wearing his father's uniform and his series was titled occupations i used to kid myself that these were my preoccupations in my mind this all 
converged with my sensibilities and political outlook uh, regarding Israel, regarding the uh, use and the manipulation, if one could say that, of the history of the Holocaust on Israelis and the way I experienced it myself. Um, this series has been a very, very particular obsession of mine. Um, these are samples of drawings that were done at the time from life. Um, and they too were um, assembled, different uh, mediums were used, sometimes drawing in charcoal, sometimes ink, sometimes in collage. Um, and as I work through these pieces, as I work through these series, uh, a certain flow of associations, of ideas, um, I just allow it, I allow them to take their place. Um, there's the myth of the mandrake plant, which uh, the ancient, the medieval myth about it was that it grew from underneath um, it grew from the semen of a hung man. Um, somehow or other, these things, uh, they just meld together for me in all sorts of unexplainable ways. The regeneration of a horrific experience, the regeneration of a horrific idea. Um, uh, you know, this whole project is inquiring into the interdependency of gesture and narrative. And in certain instances, I isolate the gesture and uh, distilling things, um, seeking to... Uh, the truth is I sometimes don't know what I'm seeking to do. Other, to, other than to express what's going on through my mind. This is a collage. Uh, and then around 2011, dealing with the idea of the Holocaust, dealing with the idea of anti-Semitism, dealing with the notions of racism and how I see them manifest themselves. Um, I started this series called The Adventures of Fagan. Fagan is uh, one of the premier anti-Semitic characters in, in the Western canonic literature. And in Dickens' own usage of an invention of this character, there's a very fascinating uh, narrative that had to do with Dickens himself selling his house to a Jewish couple who he befriended the wife who took him to the task uh, about the character of Fagin. And within the life of the editions of Oliver Twist, uh, Dickens himself edited the narrative uh, to diminish the amount of times he referred to the character as a Jew. He was called the Jew. And until by the end of his life, uh, the character was just referred to as Fagin. Um, I found myself uh, attracted to and influenced uh, by uh, a movie and one of actually the most earliest animated movies called The Adventures of Prince Ahmed by Lotta Renninger. Um, I think that her work has also influenced the animated work of Carol Walker, an artist that I admire very deeply and I have been influenced by and following. Um, this, um, this particular series brought about the whole notion of attributes, physical attributes, caricature, caricature and how it's used um, in order to distill characters. Um, these are details from the previous um, 
series. Um, Fagan meeting various characters from the Middle East, uh, haunted by his own background, I guess. And at times also uh, conflating all these various preoccupations of mine into one image. Um, Uh, as a painter and as a draftsman, I, I, I seek, uh, I, I research into the formal capacity of distilling things down using uh, form as uh, an inspiration to continue working. These helicopter drawings reminded me of, of uh, whales, um, whale, the major whale narrative. Of Moby Dick starts with the words, call me Ishmael. So these are just associations, Ishmael being the, the uh, equivalent of Abraham to the Jews, Ishmael is to the Arab nations, uh, Arab identity. Um, once again, these are details from the bigger assembly. And um, at around 2014, that's when this painting was done. This is called Like Us on Facebook. Uh, there was a a period in, in the United States at that point where there was a certain euphoria around uh, Barack Obama's presidency, a presidency that utilized drones on a daily basis for assassinations all around the world. So I, I just, I felt like I, there's a certain loneliness and feeling that um, these things are going on all the time, all around the world, and realizing and recognizing a very, very safe and privileged existence, and a certain degree of discomfort and guilt. Um, I cannot... Um, not mention Andy Warhol and his influence or my interest in his work and his use of seriality, um, the ubiquitousness of pornography, its intersection with violence, with imagery permeating our lives. Um, And um, at a certain point, influenced by a friend who started himself, a painter in Israel, a friend called Hanan Shlonsky, who started a series of uh, smoke plumes in very particular locales, in a sense. I was inspired by that to actually move the smoke plumes out of a particular locale or a particular contextuality and realize that these things, these smoke images are following humanity around all the way up to this moment, as we all know. We experience them, we relate to them or not. Uh, I find myself I guess the word relating isn't the right word, but haunted perhaps. And in a sense, these plumes became silhouettes of other kinds of uh, creatures of sorts. In the midst of all this, uh, 
going continuing from the Fagan character, I found myself quite interested in the Hasidic community around us here in Williamsburg. Found myself attracted to the pictorial, practically romantic sense of that community in my mind, of course, I don't know that all of these things could be uh, questioned as far as their reality is concerned. So I uh, embarked on a series of Hasidic Jews riding their bicycles around, which is something you see once in a while. I found it, I found it uh, quite a, a pictorially and personally a very, very uh, evocative image. Now, all the while, the saluting figure continued. And um, at a certain point, it became obvious that I would never be able in my lifetime or even a few to make six million of these saluting figures. So I resorted or reverted to starting to make um, a very, very primitive, by primitive means, making these prints, these paint stick uh, prints uh, using uh, metal stencils. Um, and that allowed uh, the sense of amount and volume and the sheer horror of the idea of numbers, numbers of casualties, numbers of victims um, to take on physically such a large uh, presence in my work. And physically, when I would exhibit them. Um, many of these pieces uh, that I'm showing now were done after the next president, Donald Trump, uh, uh, famously said that there were some very fine people on both sides of the altercation in Charlottesville. And, uh, and uh, it was actually the first time that in my life in the United States, seeing people walking with torches and saying Jews will not replace us, uh, experiencing uh, definitely very far removed physically but nonetheless, uh, mentally and spiritually seeing that on the American television and then having him say that uh, somehow brought about the transformation of the imagery for me from an accusatory stance that was related to Israel in my mind. It suddenly became a stance of identification of my own and it brought about my own uh, consideration of my own family's history, uh, my own family's uh, role in being victims of the Holocaust, and then my own role in being a victimizer as an Israeli. Uh, a good friend, Paul Bauman, offered me his studio to exhibit these, um, to try and exhibit all of these drawings. Um, I'll just go back to that for a second. It was actually quite a, a pivotal moment for me to, to exhibit all these drawings, um, piling them up as I did. Um, these plumes of smoke are from just a year and a half ago from the last bombing campaign that Israel conducted in the Gaza Strip. And so are these. These um, are oil stick drawings or paintings that are, I utilize old paper pallets that I mount to canvas and I just uh, work on top of them. Um, and 
it was impossible not to, uh, with my concerns, with my interests, not to uh, research and to go back to the earliest uh, examples of the technological photography and film use in propaganda and of the salute. Um, so I found myself uh, looking into the work of Lenny Riefenstahl, um, using stills from her movies as sources. Um, and uh, within that context uh, my interest and my my own personal dialogue with german artists um, brought me very much in proximity to gerhard richter's work uh, i found myself using uh, four photographs that were actually taken at auschwitz um, there's very little I can say about it. I mean, there's very much I can say about it, but I think I'll just let the images speak for themselves. In one of the photographs, if one zooms in, as we do nowadays or enlarges a detail, there's uh, a scene of figures of naked women running in the woods, um, kind of uncannily looking like a Poussin painting. Um, so these, those photographs were the source of these drawings and these works. Um, I started working on floor rags that are a staple of Israeli homekeeping. Um, in fact, all around the Mediterranean where houses are, the floors are tiled, these rags are a staple uh, in Israel, they, for me, they resonated in a very particular way. I started working on these, uh, on these rags and then mounting them to canvas. And in, at the point that I was doing that series, um, this was in the midst of the, uh, of the pandemic. Uh, I was struck one night while listening to the radio when the statistics of the demographics of the pandemic were brought about uh, in relation to the black communities in America. And I, 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 I just couldn't not uh, relate to it in some sort of way. I felt like it was a modern day lynch. And I began making drawings and works of lynches and then came about the problematics of me addressing that imagery. And so I found myself uh, falling on the imagery of these stripes, which resonated for me both in relation to the Holocaust and in relation to the chain gangs of the South where incarcerated people were dressed in stripes. Um, it sounds simplistic, but it served the purpose of being able to address my emotions, my feelings, and um, managing to utilize it uh, to my mind and incorporating it within the imagery and the concerns of the salutes. Um, I should just say that in the Holocaust, uh, the stripes were vertical. In the South, in the chain gangs and in the incarceration, the stripes were horizontal. Um, this was another, the accumulation of the uh, saluting figures uh, with the stripes, with the painting from Lenny Riefenstahl. These were all exhibited at the Elizabeth Harris Gallery. Um, 
And the stripes were done on the same floor rags, the same Israeli floor rags uh, in paint stick, then mounted onto canvas. And what's happened since is that I've been overcome by these stripes. They have served as surrogates and they have become, um, I don't know, I'm not, I don't know that I have exactly a vocabulary to say exactly what they've become for me. They've become a way to continue addressing all the things that, I, that I've addressed till now, but within an idiom of abstraction. Um, some, of, some viewers have related to these things in the form of uh, thinking of offenses, thinking of texts with redactions. Um, and um, these are just like the smoke stacks from before are done on the pallets. These are all very recent. Some of these are literally from a few days ago. Some of them are from a few months ago. Um, this whole series is called Some Restrictions Apply. Uh, it seems like by restricting myself, I've actually opened up the doors for a whole new venue of inquiry that is both uh, formal and, and literal and in my mind, I hope metaphoric. Um, I vary in formats. Um, I vary in, in how I address myself to the issue of these stripes, these grids, obviously being uh, iconic is too small a word from the point of view of the history of abstract painting as to their importance. And I would just, uh, for the moment, uh, end with this piece. It's called Woke Painting, number one. Uh, I sometimes entertain myself with my titles. Uh, find the uh, double entendre, the provocative aspect of how uh, concepts can be misrepresented or represented and misconstrued. And these have all been tools of mine to continue my inquiry. And I think that with that, I would uh, go back to Michael and see how we could talk about this for a bit. Thanks, Al. Um, could you talk a little bit more about these, these abstractions? Because they're, I mean, you know, I'm using that word, but because these paintings are different and there are, you know, there's color behind them and there's light behind them. And, and I wonder if you could just give us a, a little bit more idea of how they're, a, a, diff, a better idea of how they're made. Because they're very, they're different than the stripe paintings that you had in the show. Um, well, they're, for me, they're a continuation. Um, uh, they are in, I guess in their pure form, if one could use that, they're an idiom. And as an idiom, I, I find myself continuously looking for new ways to uh, make them and continue finding myself uh, uh, 
invested in them emotionally and intellectually. Um, so sometimes they are an act of negation. Sometimes they are an, uh, they are, uh, an act of, they have a certain clarity and simplicity which allows me just to do them. Um, it's been fascinating for me to see and experience the responses that I have to them and that other viewers have to them. Um, in certain times, they are evocative of trees. They go back to those wood woodlands that I was uh, dealing with or addressing with those drawings from from the concentration camp. Uh, sometimes they obviously evoke fences, um, but sometimes they are just what they are. They're stripes, and uh, they're, I give myself different uh, systems, but with which to try and variate my experience of making them. Um, the distances between the stripes, the growing distances, um, the dissatisfaction. Um, there's an endless, endless uh, uh, amount of source material in this. My, my dialogues uh, in my mind with other painters are very enriching to me and, and um, there's an, there was an Israeli painter, actually a Holocaust survivor called Moshe Kupferman, who painted stripes his whole, his whole career as a painter were stripe paintings. Uh, I find mine somewhat different, but in some sort of uh, dialogue with all stripe painters. <laughs> Frank you, Stella, oh, sorry, go ahead, Michael. Uh, I just wonder, how do you, see these paintings in terms of abstraction. Um, you know, we had a little bit of a discussion about them and I mentioned to you that the abstract paintings never really seem abstract, that they are abstract on some level, but there's always something, you know, pushing at them. Um, uh, you know, various forms of, of history that seem to be trying to get out or trying to express themselves, but they also do belong on some level to the history of abstraction. So I wonder, like, I wonder what that word abstraction means to you. And I wonder, you mentioned Cook for Men, but I, I also wonder whether there are other artists, other painters, abstract painters who are in your mind when you make these works. Well, you know, Frank Stella burst onto the scene with black stripe paintings with some very evocative and provocative titles. Um, so I'm, I'm not inclined uh, particularly towards the more formal, pure geometric notion of abstraction. And on the other hand, I'm not necessarily uh, involved in some sort of action painting uh, Franz Kleinian kind of, uh, uh, you know, canvas within which maybe I'm seeing, I'm, in, I, I'm predisposed to some sort of middle ground that incorporates quite a lot of, of input, uh, both from my own emotions, from my sense and knowledge of history and, and a dialogue with it. Painting these stripes on the palettes uh, enabled me to uh, find a place uh, where the combination of a negation and an exposure, a dialogue between a foreground and a background, um, um, sometimes it's just fun to do them. <laughs> <laughs> With let me, let me let me ask you, you you the word surrogate um you know was important to you you mentioned at the beginning where the helicopters and the camels were sort of surrogates for you and 
And I wonder in relation to these paintings too, they, that word seems to have some application. And I wonder if you would use that word in relation to these paintings as well. And if so, what it would mean to you? Well, um, the impetus in the beginning was the inability, uh, the questionability to address anybody other's horror than mine. Um, and I find that the current uh, political or I find that the current discourse for its own reasons, and I'm, I, I'm not bringing this up as a critical stance, but just as a, a position within which uh, there is a limited, there seems to be a limited scope within which one can address a certain kind of figurative imagery. Um, so in that sense, the stripes became surrogates for for figurative imagery that I found myself either personally uncomfortable or within the context of the discourse within which I am active as an artist, very limiting, not very limiting, but limiting. And, you know, that's how the, the title, the working title for the whole series of Some Restrictions Apply came up for me. Um, so I've, it's been quite a, uh, an elucidating and it's been quite a, an eye-opening experience as a painter to, to see how, to what extent, uh, what seemingly are abstract idioms, how emotionally um, laden and, and, and volatile they are for me. Um, and they've enabled me to, to actually, for me, to enrich, if I may use that term, if, uh, broaden and expand my interaction with painting itself, um, if that's... Yeah, let me, let me, one of the interesting questions the, the work raises for me, <clears throat> and maybe these the stripe paintings more than um, others, and I'm not sure. And it, 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 it comes back to this notion, to this issue of representation and, and the sense that in your work that, um, that, there is, that there are limits to representation, that there, are, that there is material that, that, that cannot be represented. But I also feel, on the other hand, that there are no limits to what can to what can be said. It's almost like in this work, the unspeakable it doesn't exist because things can be spoken. But in terms of images, there are certain images that are impossible. So the they they and the the work almost pushes me that way from um, you know or the, the, the these visual fields and what can't be said here, but what's felt here, and then pushes me into, a, into forms of discussion or conversation where in a sense, anything is possible. And that, that's almost like a little bit of a reversal of, 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 of a lot of abstract painting where in a sense, the, there's so much, um, uh, so much contestation about the idea of, of what can be said and about the verbal, but somehow the verbal in this work feels to me like a more possible, a freer vein than, than the image, which has to be uh, like really carefully modulated because their place, their limits to it, there are places that, that they can't go. And I think in, you know, this also becomes in a way the strength of the work, but I just wondered if you would respond to that in any way you feel like. Well, um... If I, if I had to sum up my involvement with or my inquiry into imagery leading up to these paintings, uh, the notion of reversal was, uh, was uh, 
a primary activating force of it. And um, if you, as a viewer, identify what you just described in these things, then I feel very lucky. Then I feel that, that those notions of reversal, um, I used to refer to it and I still refer to it as inversion. That is to say, taking an image and uh, actually assuming that what we see in ourselves and what we see in other people is not actually what we are. Um, and that's the whole problematic of identification through what would seem to be superficial attributes. Um, I, I watch people getting bombed halfway across the planet and I literally feel like I'm being bombed myself. And I, and I wonder how is it, why is it that when we look at a certain group going through hell, we don't respond in the same way to another group going through hell. So my notion, uh, the assumptions that I that I think when I say we, it's a very large we, the assumptions that we make about appearance um, are very uh, dangerous and insidious. And um, there aren't any assumptions about these stripes other than them being stripes. If I have managed to endow them, or if they are endowed in spite of myself with the sense of those inversions, that what I'm seeing is not actually what I assume is there, and, uh, and that I would hope to be seen with the same degree of neutrality. Um, I guess that's what I'm trying to do, Michael. I, I don't know how I could sum it up in the eloquence that you have. Maybe if I could, I wouldn't have been making them. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the, the size of the work? Because you remain, <clears throat> you remain within certain kinds of frameworks uh, and there's a certain size that it seems like you won't go beyond. And, and, uh, and you're, you're definitely comfortable within, comfortable, maybe that's not the right word, but it is a, a format that you sort of work with. I mean, these are 12 by nine. And, but you don't go much bigger than that. And I'm wondering why you remain within or, or what it would be like for you to, to, let's say, think about something, a painting that was, you know, four by five or eight by 10 or something, something like that. Well, what's behind me on the wall is the beginning of that. Mm -hmm. um, you, you could see um, the issue of size has been an issue for many years. It, it uh, for me had to do has to do with the consistency of being able just to work to paint which in the reality of just the lifestyle and uh, you know doing other things other than painting uh, it enables me to to get them done um, I I uh, what's the word uh, I, I would really like to manage to bring these to a different scale to a physical scale where in my I'm a natural draftsman so to speak so my movement uh, my go-to movement is from my wrist and I am now slowly moving into a, into a realm where the movements are coming from my elbow and uh, there's some stretched canvases over there waiting for my shoulder to be in action. So um, I just have a, I feel 
it's not so much a sketchbook size, but it's definitely a size, the accumulation. There is, I have an attraction to the accumulation also. Um, I'm inclined to work from one piece to another. I'm inclined to be driven by this, my dissatisfaction with how one piece doesn't actually manage to sum up or incorporate everything that I have invested in it. Um, uh, I'm hoping to, to move into a scale where the engagement with these things, both f- from the maker's point of view and from the viewer's point of view, takes on a different scale and a different experience of viewing them. I think um, that you know, what's driving my question a little bit is that the, there's this element of excess. Um, I mean, in your imagery, the, the histories that you're dealing with, it, it, there's a kind of uncontainability uh, in all of it. Um, you know, it will always sort of overflow whatever kind of container that we choose to put it within. And, and so wondering how the, this element of containment or the grid you know, actually works with this with this kind of uh, historical and personal excess, um, and the the way the control actually works with the the lack of control. And I think sometimes it's you know it's really successful to me. As I said, I feel with these 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 paintings that there's always there's something pushing at it, you know, from back there or out there, and uh, and it's very hard to name it. Uh, and it's very hard to control it. And to some degree, the bars of the painting, you know, both hold it in and call attention to it. So I think that the limits can be successful too in terms of the seriality. But, uh, you know, I wonder about the, the bigness and the excess and the danger too that you're working with. And, and they're wondering whether on, at some point you might need a, a different scale, which is what you're, you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 that's what's happening at the moment. Um, you know, in the previous work, uh, you know, all, uh, the series had a more cohesive, I wouldn't say a narrative, but they came together as one piece, uh, even though the drawings had to, uh, they had to satisfy me individually. Uh, they had to be, uh, they had to sustain themselves formally in order to be part of the group. These are grouped together. Actually, this what's on the screen right now is grouped together in order to have it available for actually for this presentation. Um, the paintings, as as I show, they 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 are singular paintings. They're not made to be seen as a series. And I, I think that what you're uh, suggesting is, uh, if one could use the word logic in painting, then it's the logical next step is, the, is pushing the boundaries of the scale and seeing how that would affect the boundaries and the restrictions that are being applied to all of this so, for me. I want to, before we open it up, uh, I. There are some relationships to art history that I wanted to ask you about. And, and to start with the studio school, because you, you came to the studio school at a point where, where uh, de Kooning, Giacometti, and Gustin were still really important figures. Uh, I mean, maybe they still are, but they, were, they, were, they had an immediacy then. And I think of them all as image haunted. Um, artists and uh, you know, it's, it's certainly in de Kooning's, you know, black paintings and probably in the abstractions at all, but at the abstractions as well. But I, I, I wanted to ask you about Gustin um, and uh, you know, thinking a little bit about his clan paintings and uh, what he does with those images of horror and uh, the way that they also get sort of diffused and, and, and mocked and, and sometimes, you know, I, I've been looking at your images and I feel like I, I see him on the, I see him lying in bed, you know, with a cigarette and all sort of disproportion. And maybe I can imagine that what's going through his mind 
are some of the images that that you painted. Maybe, you know, maybe it's Fagan, maybe it's the helicopter, maybe it's the bomber, you know, I don't know. But I, I think there's a particular way of being obsessed with history that's both personal and and way beyond personal. And and some of, you know, you came into that moment in the school and I wonder how you actually think about that now and how much you how much those artists might have affected the, you know, what you do. Wow. Well, uh, it's a tall order. Um, those guys are, the guys and the gals who were there, they're a tall order. Um, you know, there's a, I'm going to paraphrase somebody, you know, Gustin is my Elvis, you know, I, uh, you know, uh, uh, there have been some lump paintings that I've been titling them Goldstein and Rothkowitz, who were Philip Gustin and Mark Rothko. Definitely a generation where their Jew Jewishness was of a whole different uh, set of circumstances and considerations. Um, I, I, I there was a certain, uh, you know, the school, my experience at the school was a profound one on many different levels, not least meeting my wife there. Um, and uh, on a formal level, it, it endowed me, I feel like it endowed me with tremendous tools with which to sustain my what's called my practice. Um, you know, there's that, there's that age old story that is attributed to Giacometti and it's been attributed to Gustin or to Cage telling it to Gustin of everybody being in the studio with you when you start working until they start getting up and leaving. Mm -hmm. I don't mind. Uh, I don't mind the presence. I mean, maybe, maybe it's problematic, or maybe it's not. Uh, I like coming into my studio, and if if anybody of of all the painters that we mentioned, uh, also some of the painters that we haven't mentioned, some of the living painters, uh, I I feel. Um, Lucky isn't a good word, but privileged uh, to be uh, able to uh, being informed by the living, by the dead and the living. Mm -hmm. um, there are people, uh, you know, Marlene Dumas and Luke Tuimans and Kentridge and uh, Kara Walker. Those are painters who use imagery. They intrigue me, they, they, I, they inspire me. I feel, if I could bring it back to the school, I feel that my inclinations are towards uh, a painterly idiom that perhaps I seek that as my singularity within painters who try and deal with imagery and so much of the imagery being sourced out of photography. <clears throat> I find um, I'm less interested in or less inclined in the notion of um, using photography as a source um, for picture making. I see photography in my mind as a source um, like uh, that term, you know, the aide de memoir, you know, like Bonnard making little drawings. Uh, I sometimes look at photography as an aid to into the realm of painting as I see it for myself. Um, I, think, I think of your work almost as, I think of photography as almost being the enemy uh, in the sense <laughs> that, well, in the sense that you know, you, you, you take these images, these sort of danger images and, and the way you work with them totally unfreezes them. And, and, and what you do sort of moving them from one to another and playing with them and experimenting with them and animating them is almost, is a kind of unfreezing 
uh, so that they don't get fixed. And and in their on in their not being fixed, they also lose uh, a, the, a kind of the power that they have. It's like a it's like a disempowering act. The way I see your kind of seriality, you know, in relation to the to the Heil Hitler, the saluting too. It's it's a disempowering and a, and and it's just it functions to me almost like the opposite of photography. Well. What, what more can I ask for? One, I want one more question and I, you know, I'd love to see your, what, what people have to say. And, and uh, it relates to Kendrick and Kara Walker and uh, you know, also you know, sort of history image obsessed artists, but they're, they're also artists who work with narrative and um, they're kind of storytellers. And I feel like there's a kind of anti-narrative, there's, all the way through your work, like the hint of these really powerful stories. But the idea of stringing together some kind of narrative, um, you know, the way they, the way they do, that, that, that seems sort of impossible here. And I'm, I'm interested if you, if you feel that way, and if you feel that way, if you feel somehow maybe the notion of narrative is broken for you, or you can't, the, you you can't string things together that way. Why that is? Um, maybe it's because of my experience of my own narrative. Um, I've been living personally a life of a certain kind of duality. I was born here in the States to Israeli parents and went to Israel speaking English. Uh, I, in Israel, I felt attracted back here to the United States, felt, uh, and besides how I felt myself, the duality with which I felt myself in is also something to do with how I see the narratives around me. I see the dualities in them. I, I don't see the absolutes. And I know it's, it's a treacherous uh, space to be navigating because in a world of good and evil, uh, one seeks the absolutes from a moral standpoint. But uh, in my day-to-day -day experience, even in my own life, uh, from the point of view of what I had been exposed to or what I had been demanded to do as a human being, I have continuously experienced the duality of it. <clears throat> and um, I know there's evil and there's no duality to that. But when I'm painting, I find myself uh, more inclined towards uh, towards the dualities rather than the absolutes. Um, it might explain why you don't see a clear narrative and it might actually also just be a certain kind of disposition. Um, perhaps, I don't know how to sum it up, Michael. I, I, I honestly don't. Um, I, I think that I seek in my own life somehow a capacity of identification and empathy with the with the that that great old other and I find myself uh, hoping that the other would uh, give me the same amount of space I've been pigeonholed in my life I have pigeonholed in my life I have been, I have experienced racism, even if it's a primordial thing that has to do with my ancestors, and I have experienced it as applying it to other people. To the extent that I could transmit that experience into my paintings and yet come away feeling that there's a clarity between the good and the evil, then that's what I'm, that's, that's, those are the waters that I'm navigating as a painter. 
Um, and those are the narratives that attract me. Okay. Great. Sam, do you want to field questions or you know present the questions to Al? Sure. Um, I'll give a, a applause on behalf of our audience here. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. I see that there's a few added here um, already, so we'll get to that. But if you do have any questions, please do put them in. I know we have um, a very esteemed crowd in the audience. Um, sure, yeah, forget it. So I'll just, uh, just, this question is from Joyce. Um, they're asking, or they say, beautiful work, thank you. Could you please speak to the luminous light you achieve and the limited palette that you use? Um, my limited palette is a disposition. I, I'm not a fauvist, I guess, uh, by nature. And if I do manage to achieve any luminosity, then it's, uh, it's, the mir it's a miraculous event for me. Uh, I don't have any system down about it. Uh, perhaps, you know, a lot of what I show is what's survived my own editing process. Maybe the ones that aren't luminous are the ones that get painted over or get destroyed. Um, uh, but I definitely don't have any theoretical uh, system by which I work to achieve it. Uh, I feel sometimes I achieve it in spite of myself. If I do achieve it. Um, uh, Janice is, is wondering sort of something along the same lines, but um, it also wondering if you could speak to whether or not you've ever painted in full color palettes. Can you say that again, Sam, whether or not I what? Have you ever, like, have you used a full palette, like a full range of colors? Um, in my life, I have, I guess, uh, you know, this work is not that work. Um, I guess, uh, you know, I uh, you know, one has to choose one's own tools. Uh, you know, you, you sometimes, I guess, uh, there are those who compose with a whole orchestra or a quintet or just for the piano. And, uh, you know, when I set out to, to say what it is I'm trying to say, these are my natural inclinations. Um, Maybe when I sit on the, uh, the Riviera, I'll go back to my Fauve palette at some point. But at the moment, uh, when I'm thinking about the things that I'm thinking about, color isn't necessarily part of the subject for me. Um, this question's from Mark. Um, they're asking, is the emotional content for you, I.L., inherent in the unity of marks and emptiness in the abstract work or in the mark making itself? Well, that's, I, I, I can you say, I, I don't understand the question. Can you try and say that again, please, Sam? Um, I think they're asking if it's the, the emotional content is a combination of their word is unity of marks with the emptiness in the abstract work or is it in the mark making itself? Okay. Um, I think it's both. The unity is a decision made, uh, you know, to make, to work with stripes, uh, to limit my vocabulary. Um, if I manage in a limited vocabulary to evoke uh, my emotions, then I would consider it a successful endeavor. Um, I don't know much more what I can say about that. 
Um, Michael, I would say if you want to jump in at any point to ask another question, you should. But um, I'm, I'm curious if I out in these stripe paintings, like, is it a, do you ever have a, a process where images are coming and going and, and then the stripes appear and disappear? And, you know, are you, are you is that the, a process that happens or, or not really? Well, I have, I've been in, I'm inclined to try and apply the stripes onto more uh, outspokenly figurative work. I haven't done it yet. I'm, I keep on thinking of doing it. Um, you know, uh, applying them on top of the palettes uh, was sufficient for me. Uh, I don't know, I, I'm curious myself to see what would happen once I, once I do that. There's, it's, uh, it's very, it might even be considered pretty violent an act to cancel out a figurative image with these stripes. But, you know, uh, it's quite a, it, it, when we're talking about it now, I'm thinking about the idea of uh, idolatry and uh, basically confronting a, a graven image. It might be a little too literal, but I won't know until I try, uh, Sam. And uh, I hope to have uh, the capacity to continue doing this. Uh, I'll let you know. <laughs> hey, Al, the, I mean, it, it, it seems with a, a number of these images, including what we're looking at, but others too, that they're almost dream images. Like they're all, you know, there's almost like a kind of hallucinatory quality. Uh, you know, they're on the verge of, of visions or dreams or hallucinations. And, and I wonder for you in the making of them, whether they take on that particular reality or that um, particular identity. I would, I would rather use the word nightmares. Mm -hmm. um, we're surrounded by nightmares. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know why, but I find myself preoccupied with nightmares of this sort. Um, you know, Michael, my mother-in-law used to say to me, what's wrong with cows in the meadow, you know? Uh, so uh, yeah. you got to go with what your heart tells you. And this goes back to something I was saying before. I was lucky enough that the nightmares that I lived through, I escaped relatively unscathed. Um, but I think that the things that haunt us, uh, we don't have to necessarily go through them literally on our by ourselves. And the example of Gaston is a great example of that. Um, you know, Goya, um, one of his one of his great etchings has the title "I Saw This." Um, I've in this day and age, we see things without being there. Um, and uh, to that extent, what you're talking about photography is the stillness of photography. Uh, it, it it has photography has the capacity to um, broaden our experience of reality from the point of view of to think that we actually saw something. Um, we're all of us walking around with a store of millions of images in our pockets. And uh, I find that haunting too. Um, I find I find the, I find the mental spaces that we have to navigate now with this proliferation of 
horror on the one hand and and crap on the other uh you know we're I, i'm looking for something something else in there um but anyhow uh the dreamscapes are are horror horrific in my mind uh, and they haunt me they really do um while i work and while i'm not working um that's the world that we live in um this, this question is from amanda and i don't don't quite understand the second part of it but um um they're wondering what it, does it give you at this stage to paint into the darkness and um maybe that's what does it give me <laughs> yeah <laughs> It don't give me nothing, you know. I I do it. I've got piles of this stuff. I, I can give it, you know. It doesn't give... Well, I'm kidding, you know. It gives me the sense that I'm alive and that I'm facing it and that I'm addressing it and that I'm not turning away from it. Um, there were times where I thought, considering some of the people, some of the artists that we were talking about... <clears throat> I thought to myself that my sense of duality could be interpreted as a, as, a, as a sign of cowardice. Like if you've got something to say, come out and say it. Um, and what I have to say is that I, I'm just as much of a culprit by living in New York City in, in late capitalism as to my mind, as anybody who picks up a gun anywhere else around the world and does something awful, I, I, that's my sense of the world. So what I get is, is a sense that I'm looking at it, at least while I'm here in the studio, I'm looking at it in, in the eye. It might be a fantasy. Um, it might not. Uh, um, I do. I mean, you know, if I can just interject, I, I, I do feel <clears throat> that um, that that, that, that there's, a certain, there's a certain kind of petrifaction to to it's what I was saying about photography a bit to to the images, even though the images of the Sig Heil image, uh, you know, it's like a petrified image. It's like frozen in time and frozen in people. <laughs> in people's um, imaginaries. So actually to deal with it the way you do it, the way you do it sort of, it unpetrifies it. And, um, you know, there's, there's in these images, you know, it's a young boy in many of them. Uh, these are not like monstrous figures. These are almost people, images of people who don't quite know what's happening to them and what their body is actually doing to them. So I feel that there's a like there's an impulse in your work to go to these danger zones and then to unfreeze them to kind of open them up so that the images that that can um, just lock themselves mentally and emotionally in people's minds and have also have an opportunity to go someplace else or to do something else or to loosen up you know loosen up or become something else so you know in relation to Amanda's question of what what you might get out of doing these images. Like I, I see them like performing um, a really interesting possibility uh, in terms of the, the danger histories that, they, that they're dealing with and, and doing something else with them. You know, by constantly working with them image after image, like something else can happen. And that's, that's significant to me. Well, um, I don't know what else could happen. I guess that's the mystery that uh, with which I, I'm compelled. You know, these things are compelling to me. Um, you know, as a viewer and as a painter and as a painter who studies the history of painting and art, I, I don't have a problem looking at a Morandi for hours. I, I don't have a problem uh, um, 
that, that's a that's a inverted way of saying I I these are my compulsions. Um, uh, the uh, beginning of these saluting figures actually started literally 36 years ago in Israel where I was studying in Bezalel and I made a self-portrait of myself as a Nazi. Um, that was part of my response to Kiefer. I thought, well, if, you know, what, you know, I, I was kind of in a young, provocative, competitive kind of point of view saying, what's the big deal that he's wearing his Nazi uniform? I mean, that's where it came from. And I was compelled to say and to express my sense that these monsters are in all of us, or at least I should say, I could see how this monster dwells in me. And um, uh, this, isn't a, this isn't an exorcism. It's, a, it's, a, it's an experience of that duality that I mentioned. And uh, I don't know, it, uh, it, I feel, I feel uh, compelled to address these things. Um, and um, the experience of doing them from life was a certain kind of experience, doing them with, doing them with different kinds of models, people who took on the, the stance, the gesture, the meaning of it, the association of it differently affected me differently when I was doing it. Um, I come to my work with a lot of ideas. And as um, I think it was uh, Baudelaire who told Dega that poems aren't written by with ideas, they're written with words. I, uh, you know, I start with the ideas and I'm... Uh, I'm left with the bare bones activity itself. And perhaps there's a residue of all the things that I bring to it. Um, I seek a certain distillation, um, but it's like you're saying, Michael, I mean, how do you distill horror? Uh, there have been painters who've managed. If I'll ever manage, I'll... Uh, I'll rest easy. <laughs> well, um, maybe this is a good time to 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 stop. But um, so I'm sorry if I didn't get to your comment or question. But I want to thank our guests both so much for for being here tonight. And I all it's really um, generous of you to um, to go into your work as deeply as you have. And Michael, your contribution through the conversation was, was really fantastic. So um, I wanna thank our audience members again for, for being here. I wanna just quickly announce that we are not, we've had some in-person lectures sort of in a very um, small sense at the school, but I know some people are a little confused. So if you're tuning in tonight, just continue to tune in um, for the rest of the season. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll leave it to you, Ayal, for, and Michael, for any last thoughts. But thank you all again for joining us tonight. And, um, and Ayal, would you? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think I'd, I'd just like to thank everybody again. Uh, it, it would be untruthful to say that this uh, wasn't very moving for me. Um, both the doing it under the auspices of the school um, and having the opportunity. I haven't had many opportunities to present my work in this fashion. And uh, it's been a very enriching and uh, I feel very privileged and I feel very thankful. And I wish everybody watching uh, all the best, honestly. 
and uh, hope for better days for everyone near and far. And, thank you. Uh, good yeah. night. Um, yeah, thank you. And uh, hopefully we'll see you on H Street soon, Ayal. And uh, All can, right. uh, you know, uh, chat some more. And that goes for you as well, Michael. Um, thanks, everybody.